Hi, uh, so my name is Raj. Uh, so I work as a developer evangelist for Microsoft. It was kind of funny actually. Uh, I was coming, uh, you know, I wanted to see where this place is. So I going to look it up on my phone. So I put, uh, you know, Nokia drives, I put the address just next. And it gave me an address in, in Shanghai, China. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you all to China. <laughs> There you go. It's, it was only about 4,096 kilometers. <laughs> um, so one thing John mentioned was that, uh, you know, how many of you here are JavaScript addicts, right? Uh, how many of you are not? So we have a couple of people here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, this is probably the wrong session to uh, start if, uh, if my objective is to convert you into an addict, because I'm going to tell you about things that are probably not so great about JavaScript. Right, things that you have to watch out for. Um, so uh, that, that's what uh, is about JavaScript. This kind of a language that people either tend to absolutely fall in love with, or they hate, hate it with guts. Right, um, and, and there are some good reasons why why people hate it too. I mean, I, I love the language. Uh, there are some pretty amazing things that you can do with JavaScript that uh, you, you, know, you find find it hard to do with other languages, especially if you are coming from a static. Uh, programming language background like C++, C Sharp, Java, or something like that. Uh, there are things that you can do with JavaScript that you pretty much can't do anywhere else. Uh, so for those, the, I mean, those are the good parts, right? So in fact, uh, in fact, Douglas Crockford, who used to work for Yahoo for a long time, I think now he works for uh, So he's written a book called JavaScript: The Good Parts, right? Uh, and there's another JavaScript book which is very popular called as JavaScript: The Definitive Guide. Uh, there was this funny joke about that, that you know, if you look at JavaScript, the definitive guide, it's about, it's about that thing. Right? It's a really big book. And if you look at JavaScript, uh, the good parts, it's about that thing. Right? So, if people ask, you know, wow, so what is the rest of JavaScript? Right? Uh, so, so, it's a good book. You should read JavaScript, the good parts. Right? It kind of helps you to focus on what JavaScript is really good at and you know, leverage that capability in your, in your web apps. Uh, so in, in this session, we'll be looking at three JavaScript gotchas over, over 30 minutes. Uh, some of the things that you might want to watch out for. There's not much in the much information in the slides. We try out some scripts in, a, in the browser and see you know, what, what these gotchas are. So that uh, let's get started. The first thing I kind of want to talk about was uh, was about this concept of the uh, the fact that you can leak variables, right? Uh, so JavaScript in a in many ways, it's a very permissive language, right? You can pretty much do whatever you want, and uh, uh, unlike unlike static uh, type languages, which insist on uh, giving you build errors, right? If something doesn't work, it points it out. Right? It says you you made a mistake, go fix it, right? JavaScript is not so finicky about that. If something is not right, it'll say JavaScript most likely has doing something and keep going, right? Uh, so which can be a good thing, but there are scenarios where that tends to be a very bad thing. Uh, one, one place is uh, variable leakage, right? Uh, so, you know, what I'll do is I'll probably launch uh, uh, a little console here. Uh, so, this is basically a right. so this is basically a console where you can type a little piece of script and experiment with it. You know, for example, I can just type you know alert to here and if I hit call enter, it will just run the script. Uh, all right, so we can we can write through this script, and uh, there's a print statement here that we can, you know, we can do that, and the uh, output comes on the right hand side. Uh, if there are script errors and stuff, they show up on the bottom right hand side. Uh, so, so you know, when we talk about variable detail, you know, what do we what do we really mean, right? So. It's, it turns out to be surprisingly easy to make this uh, make this error, right? So let's say, uh, you know, I, I have a variable here called uh, Bangalore, right? Something. Uh, now later on, you know, what do you think is going to happen if I did something like that, right? Or let's say string. That's another thing. JavaScript is weakly typed. So one thing can be a string at one point, later on it can suddenly become a number or a date or an object, right? So. So what do you think is going to happen in this case, right? You have two different variables. 
Yeah, I mean, pretty much, so this was uh, this was C sharp or Java or pretty much any other language, just actually that language, you're going to get a compiled error. Right? And the reason is because, uh, you know, there's a, there's a typo here, right? The variable is not the same. Uh, you change the variable name, right? Now, in JavaScript, uh, unfortunately, that's nothing is going to happen here. So, I have a little error console here, right? So, if I say print Bangalore, then, you know, it, it prints foo, right? No errors in the, the bottom right hand corner. So what happened to this assignment here, right? What do you think is going to happen if I say print window dot b a n g l o r e right without the uh, without the a? You see that prints bar over there, right? So this is a this is a gotcha, right? This is a way of you know you can accidentally introduce variables to the global scope. So essentially what happens here. When you say P A N G L O R E equals bar, right? The JavaScript runtime goes and looks up to see if this variable has already been defined. Uh, so in this case, no, it's not been defined. It happily goes and adds it to the global scope, right? And uh, and that's not a good thing. Typically, you don't want something like this to happen. Uh, first of all, obviously, uh, the, you know the, the biggest problem here is that there's no error, right? And uh, your program would just keep working. Imagine a 3,000 line JavaScript uh, program. And you have this little error sneaking in somewhere, right? You can imagine how much, how difficult it's going to be to figure out this, this particular part. Uh, so that's the that's the problem here. And how do you deal with uh, with this particular thing? There are a couple of things that you can do. One is uh, so, so in JavaScript there is this concept of an immediate function, right? Does anyone know what an immediate function is? Sometimes it's called as a self-executing function, which is technically incorrect. Create an anonymous function and execute Immediately, right? So basically, uh, typically it's an anonymous function. It doesn't have to be an anonymous function, but typically it is. And uh, it's a function that you define and you invoke at the same time, right? Uh, so something like that. Right? So you can define a function here and you know, call it immediately. Right? So immediate function. So you know it, it, it executes that function. I defined it here and I called it uh, instant immediately, right? So this is one thing that you can do. Um, define all of your all of your code, right? Even if you're writing it in the global scope. Let's say in your markup, right at the top, you're putting script, uh, you know, type equal JavaScript text slash JavaScript, and then you're putting a code there. Put it inside a put it inside an immediate scope, right? Even if it's running into global scope, put it there. Basically, the benefit here is whatever variables you introduce, right? You declare a variable, by default it would, would get added to your global scope. And everybody knows global variables, not a good idea, right? It, uh, all kinds of funny things can happen. So you typically want to limit the scope of the symbols that you introduce in your program. And this is one way of you know immediately doing that. But that but this still doesn't solve the problem of uh, accidentally introducing variables to the global scope. Like if you say the Bangalore case, this would still go ahead and uh, uh, add the add the thing to the to the window object. Uh, so with ECMAScript 5, right, ES5 standard, there is a uh, there's a spec part of that that is introduced was something called a strict mode for JavaScript, right? So uh, it's it's pretty pretty cool actually. All you need to do is you know in your functions just go ahead and uh, put this little string there, string declaration there, right? Use strict in double quotes. Uh, the nice thing about ES uh, ES uh, ECMAScript 3 is that ECMAScript 5 is that uh, Many of the features, many of the enhancements in ECMAScript uh, 5 were uh, introduced with backward uh, compatibility in mind, right? So this this piece of code here will run perfectly fine on ES3 engines as well, right? ECMAScript 3 engines as well. Uh, in fact, pretty much, except for some minor, uh, some a few exceptions like uh, like property syntax or uh, you know some of these uh, access uh, protection methods like you know trees and uh, C things like that. There are some methods which are which are new in ES5 for which you do need a, a ES5 engine for it to work. But a vast chunk of it works uh, either without breaking your code or you can backfill it with library code. Right? The capabilities can be provided to a library for ES3. So here, this particular line of code will run perfectly fine in ES3 engines, but you benefit automatically on ES5 engines where strict mode basically causes your uh, uh, the script to run with some different semantics. Right, basically, uh, more stricter rules. So, what, what's going to happen is, you know, let's try that same uh, example here. So, 
I have Google is Bangalore, so I say Bangalore equals bar, right? Uh, so I say window dot. You know what? I'll probably have to refresh this page because that symbol is already in the same So, you know, right at the bottom right hand corner, you can see that this, the same code throws an error here, right? Variable undefined in strict mode, right? Uh, this is the exact same code, right? The only difference is we have a use strict at the top. So, the same code here with a typo produces an error in strict mode, which is, which is good, which is what we want. Uh, basically, in strict mode, you cannot you know, arbitrarily use a variable without declaring it first. So, it enforces that you declare a variable before you use. And uh, any error that you catch during, uh, you know, you, obviously everything here is at runtime, but at least you see the error, right? That's good. Other than it manifesting itself as a bug in your app. So, so use immediate functions uh, and use strict mode, right? So those things help. Does it have to be done on the every function? Is there a way to be running it on the whole thing? Good question. So the question is, uh, do you have to do use strict in every function or can you do it globally? Yes, you can do it globally. Uh, but in general, it's probably not a good idea. See, for example, before you include any JS file, uh, I mean, the, the use strict applies for one translation, not translation unit, what is what they call it in JavaScript. Like one file, right? So when it is uh, passing that file, the, if you put use strict at the top, then it applies for the entire uh, file. If it's top, top of the JS file, then the entire JS file. Top of function, then that function. Uh, typically, you mix code, right? So you have code that is from a library that is not strict mode compliant, and then your own code, and you don't want that to start throwing all kinds of errors. So typically for your own code or new code that you write, you absolutely should use use strict. Uh, for legacy code, if you're using a library, you might want to be a little bit more conservative there. So what browsers are for this? So all modern browsers, uh, so all the latest versions of Chrome, Firefox, Opera, Safari, they all support. IE supports it from IE9 and What if I make a typo and say use strict? In use script. So if I mistype, <laughs> very unlikely to mistype that also. <laughs> You're saying put a typo here. Uh, yeah. Then you strict mode work. <laughs> so that's the problem with backward and backward. The string motion is to make it disappear with the first <laughs> So so earlier you would have had to pay attention to every single line of script, now only one line of script. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> one line of script for five. Sorry? One line of script per file. Per file, exactly. So that's much better than the entire file. Yes. So JavaScript basically has that functions for play, right? The Correct. hoisting with this. Correct. Okay. Is this also hoisted? The use script. Yeah. The use script has to be the first line in that scope. Yes. Oh. It cannot be second, third, then it doesn't apply. Okay. Yes. Good, good point. So this this has to be the first line in a function. What is the performance impact for this? Uh, uh, I don't know, I haven't really done a performance analysis of strict mode versus not on strict, but uh, I would imagine it shouldn't be, it shouldn't impact your performance, is what my expectation would be. But yeah, yeah. it makes absolute sense to use uh, the strict. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, keep it in production mode. Correct, correct. Given that it's backward compatible, it's not going to break your apps, you know, feel free to use it. And you can use this to kind of bet your app. In your development environment, you can use a modern browser and check it, right? And if it runs fine, then chances are it runs fine over the process. We can JS when to do that. Correct. Correct. JS, so, yeah. So this is like, like you know, a little bit of JS lint inside the language itself. Part of the standard. So and this is theoretically, I think strict mode will be faster. Sorry. Theoretically, strict mode will be faster because now your compiler and everything knows that what's going to come in. There's they're not going to double check what's going to happen if you don't use strict. Right? Hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, could be. I mean, you could debate about that. I mean, I guess his concern is that now the engine has to perform these additional checks. See, earlier there was a default behavior. So this strict mode is not just about variables. There are you know, many more other checks that are made. Uh, so in this case, earlier it just added a variable. Now it has to go through an error. And there are other checks that it has to make. So the, the, the concern was what would be the performance impact of these additional checks. Uh, but then, you know, uh, these days most JavaScript engines are smart about how they run JavaScript, right? They, uh, they typically they compile it and they make it into native code and things like that. And maybe there you could potentially get some benefits out of making some assumptions uh, 
especially with inline caching, right? So things like that, maybe there are some performance benefits by using this mode. I don't know, maybe probably uh, think about that, probably talk about that. There could be benefits from, from a performance point of view. So that gentleman talked about, talk about variable uh, scoping and hosting. In fact, that's the next block chart they wanted to kind of talk about. Um, <clears throat> So again, you know, if you're if you're coming from a Java, Java, C++, uh, C sharp, or some static type language background, uh, then this is something that you might find surprising, right? Uh, <clears throat> so in, in JavaScript, turns out maybe you know what we can do is uh, we can do with an example and see what. Uh, so let's say I define a function here, right? and uh, and you know, let's say I have some if check here, right? The actual check doesn't matter. Let's say, I think that, so var i, uh, and then I say, uh, I say, i equals 10, right? And uh, let's do it differently. Let's say i equals 10, and then I say print i, right? So what's going to be the output of this? this so I call this function. So what do you think is going to be the output of this little script? So how many if you say 10? So how many if you say undefined, null, error? So, um, <coughs> let's run it. So it's kind of the JavaScript, right? You never tell what's going to come out. So 10, print 10, right? Um, so Initially, when I saw this code, right, I was like, I was like shocked because this is very counterintuitive. Right, in pretty much every other language, this would throw an error or JavaScript is very permissive, so maybe it would just print undefined. Uh, but that's not what happens. You get ten, right? Uh, so and that that's a funny thing about JavaScript, right? Uh, uh, it, it's about what defines scope, right? Pretty much the only thing that defines scope in JavaScript turns out to be a function. In fact, in the, in the previous gotcha. One of the things that I was saying is that you know you can put, put all of your global code inside an immediate function, and I was saying that the reason that you would want to do that is because you you know you restrict the scope of all your globals to that particular function. Uh, so another reason why that that turns out to be a good idea is because functions are the only thing that defines scope. So what happens here is in languages like C plus plus, curly braces define scope, right? So if you define something inside the curly brace, outside of it, it's not accessible. Uh, not in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, essentially, what this function becomes, it becomes something like this, right? So, uh, so this is what. So here, the behavior is pretty self-evident, right? Uh, you declare it here, you're assigning it here, and then you're printing it here. So that's very clear. Uh, but if you declare it inside here, it's probably not quite so clear. Uh, so this this concept is called as variable hosting, right? So what what JavaScript runtime does is when it is executing or parsing a function and running it, it's going to take all the symbols, all the variables that are declared inside the function and moves the declaration, not the definition or assignment, those things remain where they are, the declaration to the top, right, to the top of that, that particular scope. So that's essentially what happens. In fact, uh, this is the thing that actually makes uh, something like this possible. Right, so do you think this will work? I'm calling the function and then I'm defining it. Yeah. Yes. It, it does work, right? And the reason why it works is because of this. So in this scope, this whole thing has been defined here. Uh, so it takes this whole thing, puts it at the top. So it basically transforms this code into what I had done earlier, right? So it takes this, puts it at the top, and puts, uh, puts the declaration at the, at the invocation at the bottom, right? Uh, again, it's debatable, you know, whether this is a good idea or not. Probably this feature was introduced to make this kind of thing possible, uh, but. You know, uh, probably it's not such a great idea, right? I think it's always safer to declare and define things first before we can we can use them. Uh, so this is this very hosting. So the, the how do you uh, how do you deal with it? Uh, declare everything on the top, right? There's no magic magic fix for this. Uh, so there's no strict mode thing that you can do to magically fix this. You have to declare everything in the top of that particular function scope. In ES6, I think they kind of uh, trying to deal with these kinds of issues with the different kinds of syntax. Uh, think what the let keyword, I think that defines, allows you to define a, a scope where the variables that are defined there are restricted to that scope. Uh, I probably have to spend some more time reading those things up. 
but uh, with ES5, this is a this is a gotcha that you have to think about. ES3, you know, all of the early versions. Uh, the last thing I wanted to kind of talk about is uh, is about prototypes, right? Uh, the last gotcha. So, okay. So JavaScript is a is a prototypal inheritance language, right? Uh, there, are, there are a lot of frameworks out there that try to kind of mimic what you are able to do uh, with inheritance with languages like C++, right? Uh, see, inheritance in languages like C++, C Java uh, are implementation inheritance, right? That's what you're really doing. You're inheriting implementation from another type, and then you can override it or you know, completely replace it with your, uh, you know, in your subclass and things like that. JavaScript is not that, right? Jav inheritance in JavaScript is not implementation inheritance, uh, but there are libraries which try to Simulate that, right? So that people who are coming from a static language background can feel comfortable here. Um, but I think it's important to realize what JavaScript uh, you know, inheritance, how it works. So it's very simple. Um, you know, it's basically it's called as prototypal inheritance, right? The idea is, uh, let's say you have some some uh, object here, right? Let's say person. And uh, here I have uh, name, I have age, right? <coughs> Now, think of this particular object as being a prototype, right? This defines what objects that inherit from this object are going to look like. So that's another point of difference, right? With implementation inheritance, the entity that you use to inherit from stuff is a type. Right? Types inherit from other types. In JavaScript, that's not the case. Here it's instances, right? There is, there is no type. Everything is an object. So, so you, what you can do here is you can create an instance which inherits from another instance, right? So you can do something like this. I can say person two equals object dot create of person. So in this case, what essentially happens is P two is a new object, right? And P 2s prototype is person, right? So think of a prototype as being this hidden member inside that object. So so let's say I say P two uh, dot name equals bar, and I say print P two dot name. Right? And that that means that. Uh, so essentially, what happened here is when you say p2.name, p2 itself does not have that defined right in that object. So the runtime would go and inspect p2's prototype. Uh, so it would find out what is p2's prototype. That's person. So it would go here in person. Person does have a name. Uh, in fact, if I run this like this, right, then uh, you get foo and then you get bar, right? So in this case, p2 didn't have that property. It went and looked in the prototype got name and then printed foo and then you obviously assigned and then it printed that. So this is how prototype inheritance works and you can keep going like this, right? You can create another instance which inherits from P2 and you can add add more stuff. Uh, in fact, if you want to add additional members, you can do that right here. Uh, you can say, uh, you know, gender, uh, I think you have to say value, right? Now I can say print p2 dot gender, so it prints f. Um, so you can actually extend it. So when you say p2 equals object of create, you have person. Person is a prototype of p2, and then p2 has some unique members. One is called as gender, and you can keep extending that. You can have additional uh, properties, additional members inside p2. So this is great. <clears throat> now the gotcha is this, right? So imagine that in a prototype, uh, or, or let's try something here. So we have p2 dot name equals bar and then I say print p2 dot name. Great. What do you think is going to happen if I say print person dot name? Any guesses? So here I'm assigned this to bar. This should print bar. What is this going to print? Bar. Okay, let's find out. So it prints foo, right? And that makes sense because this is another instance. So I've created p2, I'm saying object of create. This is a new instance altogether. So modifying this instance should not affect this instance. Right? So that makes sense. This is good. Uh, and this works as we expect. So when you say p2.name, it, it actually, you know, that property gets created on p2 directly. It doesn't uh, go and modify the prototype's, uh, prototype's name. Right? So what happens if I say something like this? Right? I have an address object here. Right? And I say street. Uh, street one city. Now I can go and say print p2 dot 
an address dot string, right? And that works. So ST1 is printed. Now that the reason why it is printed is the runtime would come and see if P2 has a property called address. No, it does not. It goes and checks P2's prototype. Does it have a property called address? Yep, it does. So it fetches that property and that has an ST property on top of that. It works, right? Now let's say I, I want to change the city on the P2's uh, on p2.address.city, right? Uh, so I'll take this, probably print city here, and then I print person.address.city. So in this case, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, so that turns out to be the gotcha here. Now you can notice what I changed here is p2, but person city also has changed. Right? So both the P2 has changed and the prototype has changed. So if you want to take a guess why this happened? Shadow copy. Yeah, so essentially it's shadow copy. But see, if you if you think about how the JavaScript engine works, right, it makes sense. Because here when you said P2 dot address, so this this part alone, right, this is a fetch operation. Right? We're not assigning anything there. We're just saying get me the address object. On address property on P2. Runtime goes and checks, does P2 have address? No. Nope. It goes to the prototype, gets the address there, and it returns that. Now, when you say dot here, the object you're operating on is the prototype's address. Right? It might not, it might not be evident by looking at the code. Hold on a sec, I'm using P2 here, right? I'm doing P2 dot address. Why is it going and changing person dot address? Turns out because so so basically when you uh, when you have an object inside your prototype, you're assigning values to it. Uh, it's, it's essentially like a shadow copy, as you said, right? So when you say name, age, fine, right? No problem. When you assign to it, it, it creates a new property for P2 directly. But if it's a, it's an object, then it's a problem. So how do you deal with this? Uh, so you know, you need to pretty much do deep learning yourself. I mean, the runtime doesn't support this. Uh, some libraries out there come with some variant of cloning function. Uh, writing a generic cloning function turns out to be very complicated. So, uh, I so you have a pretty good uh, snippet out there. I believe it is in a, on a laptop of Okay. Uh, I can put it up on some meetup uh, site or whatever if anyone wants to get it. Sure. I will see it a few times before. It influences cloning, is it? Yeah, it does pretty, and then most of the edge cases also for cloning if I remember correctly. Cool. So, it is something like that. Yeah, so, so this is something that you have to watch out for in case you have deep object hierarchies inside your prototypes. Right. Uh, so that's that's pretty much it. So this is what I wanted to talk about. Uh, oh, exactly that. Thank you. Thank you. Still have a few minutes if you want to ask questions to us. Sure. So that's the next prototype thing almost uses, right? Like everything that I want to create will time as well. So I can just work with. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's kind of. A, you know, failing in the language itself. So, if you want to want to use prototype inheritance the way it's been done this, uh, the way it is right now in ES5, you will have to implement take care of cloning yourself. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't work. Doesn't copy script eliminate these kind of issues? Uh, not too familiar with copy script. I hope that this is handled. Does anybody know? Does copy script handle prototype inheritance? I think what I've read was like the all the variable declarations where when you go that into the yeah. It doesn't handle the deep cloning. It doesn't. Yeah. I don't know if the ES6 spec, you know, has any proposals for handling this issue. Oh. How good will the compliance of different runtimes, JavaScript runtimes, or whatever, for uh, JavaScript engines for ES5? Yes, because ES5 for JavaScript as that we know. Is used in Cube as Cube script is there in uh, WinJS is there browsers are there on the page JavaScript engines so right where can you check up on this? So uh, it's pretty easy nowadays we can find a lot of compliance pages chat sheets whatever right so see the PS5 it was by design uh, uh, like I was saying earlier a lot of functionality in PS5 can be provided through libraries right there are a lot of uh, polyfill libraries available on on the modernized GitHub page. Where you can find backfills for ES5 features, but not all of them, right? So stuff like use strict, there's no way you can provide a backfill, right? Um, so I had a little slide here which showed kind of the uh, uh, 
uh, if I can find it very quickly, maybe I'll Yeah, okay, here. So I put together a long time back. So this kind of shows, uh, let's see, IE10 platform three, three days. Uh, this kind of shows the uh, ES5 compliance across different browsers. It's very old, right? Firefox 7, Chrome 14. What is Chrome version now? Like 175? <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is very old. But uh, so this shows, you know, so there is this ES5 test suite from, if you go to ECMAScript, um, the ECMA site. So it has about 11,016 test cases, right? It's a huge number of test cases. And this graph basically plots how many test cases fail across different browser uh, JavaScript engines. And at that time, Chrome 14 was, was kind of lagging behind. I don't know what's the status right now. I'm sure it's better. But you can see that the worst performer is still only 427 failed test cases, which is minuscule compared to 11,000 test cases, right? So with all modern browsers, compliance is really stellar for ES5. Right? Uh, but what about other rendering engineers? Q script is supposed to be ECMAScript implemented in Q. We we'll have to see how that. We'll have to see that. Yeah. I mean, the script, the test suite is completely free for anybody. So they can just download, run it with your engine, and see what happens. Yeah. Okay. No more questions. So uh, thank you, Raj. Thank you.